sociedades livres versus sociedades não livres. Tomara que ele já esteja escutando esse jazz. Gabriel, o cara que vai comandar o painel agora. Neil Ferguson, bem-vindo. É um dos mais renomados historiadores da atualidade, considerado pela revista Time como uma das 100 pessoas mais influentes do planeta Terra. Roteirizou e apresentou cinco séries de documentários. Aqui ele. Cinco séries de documentários é, na, na BBC e transmitidas na televisão britânica e em outros países. A sua série A Ascensão do Dinheiro venceu o prêmio Emmy de melhor documentário com pós-doutorado em História pela Magdalene College, College da Universidade de Oxford. É especialista em Economia, Mercado Financeiro e História Econômica. Leciona lá na Universidade de Harvard e é pesquisador em Oxford, além de associado sênior do Instituto Hoover e na Universidade de Stanford. Ferguson criou recentemente uma instituição de ensino dedicada a permitir o livre debate de ideias em seus campi lá na University of Austin. Com vocês, Gabriel e Neil Ferguson. Uma salva de palmas a ele, por favor. Since our speaker today speaks English, perfect English, by the way, uh, I will conduct our panel in English. Um, It was nearly 45 years ago in April 1977 when David Goldberg, a lawyer from the American Civil Liberties Union, got a call at his office. On the other side of the line was Frank Colling, the leader of an atrocious and infamous neo-Nazi American group. Colling and his followers were being imposed fines because they were trying to demonstrate in public at Skokie, a village near Chicago, with half its population composed of Jewish families, many of them Holocaust survivors. Colin wanted Goldberg, who was also a Jewish, to defend his right for free speech under the First Amendment. After consulting Ed Rothschild, a Jewish board member of the ACLU, Goldberg got a surprise. Mr. Rothschild ordered Goldberg to take the case. If Mr. Goldberg was to be persecuted by an angry mob, Mr. Rothschild decided he would be with him down the line. Make no mistake, there is absolutely no doubt that the ideas Mr. Colling and his followers are not worth hearing or considering. They were vice, disgusting, and represent one of the darkest moments mankind has ever experienced. Both Goldberg and Rothschild were disgusted at Colling's group, but they were committed to protecting free speech not because of him, but because they believed protecting it to one person was protecting it to all Americans. Two months later, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the state of Illinois could not restrict freedom of speech, no matter the content of that speech. The Colin versus Skokie case is worth remembering today because it's an example for many gray area cases we see coming up all over the world. Not only in countries that lack a strong free institutional tradition, such as Brazil, but also the United States, Western Europe, and many others. In the words of Mr. Goldberg, to this day, the case still brings up difficult feelings about representing a client whose constitutional rights were being violated, but whose ideas represented the hatred and bigotry that continues to erupt in America's consciousness. So what are the differences between free societies and unfree societies? Is the Colling versus Koki case an example of a crossroad moment where freedom of speech must be protected even for the worst of its citizens? Is, is this something that can be easily overcome and threatened if individuals start turning an eye from it? To answer those questions, we have the distinguished honor of having for the first time the great Neil Ferguson, one of the most famous historians in the world. Neil, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Gabriel, for that uh, profound and important introduction. I am delighted to be with you. I'm only sorry that I'm not with you in person, as I have happy memories of my last visit to Porto Alegre. In a previous era, before COVID, uh, in a previous politi political era for Brazil too, I hope Soon I'll, I'll be in a position to return. I find myself 
enjoying all the benefits of freedom today, uh, including the benefit of being able to speak to you and to say whatever I like to you. But that's not the only freedom I've enjoyed today. Uh, before joining you, I was paddling uh, in a canoe on a lake with my two youngest children, two boys aged 10 and four, Thomas and Campbell. And as we paddled, we didn't have to worry that our house might be bombed, that their mother might be raped. We didn't have to worry that we might be under surveillance. We didn't have to fear that our movements might be taken as a pretext for my arrest. In fact, we didn't have to worry about anything except my getting back in time for this lecture. What I increasingly fear is that people in an earlier generation than mine, including my sons, who are born into freedom, take it for granted to the point that they can no longer imagine unfreedom. My observation of students in the United States and in other countries is that they have less and less understanding of what an unfree society is like than certainly my generation did a generation that still had a sense of what totalitarianism meant. So as I was thinking about what to talk to you about tonight, Gabrielle, I decided I would simply show you five glimpses of unfreedom. And these five glimpses are taken from personal experiences of five very different authors. This is a little different from talks that I've done in the past in forums like this. Usually I'm known for my big, broad, economic, historical perspectives. There are charts and there are maps. None of that is going to feature tonight. Tonight, I want to focus on the experience of unfreedom and to try to explain with that younger generation in mind what exactly unfreedom is like and how, by recognizing it, we can protect the institutions of a free society. In order that you don't have to look at my face, uh, to an excessive extent, I'm going to use some images uh, to illustrate my talk. I hope they're visible now, and I'm sure if they're not, somebody in the Forum de la Libertad will, will tell me. But I'm hoping that you can see. Great. I'm hoping that you can see two tables. Uh, one, famous for its size, was the large hideously ugly white table that separated President Vladimir Putin uh, from his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, when they had one of a number of highly unsatisfactory meetings in the run-up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The other, on the left of the screen, is of a small uh, desk, and at it uh, sit two democratic leaders, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, where I was born and grew up, Boris Johnson, and Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. I know both these individuals, and in some ways, you might say they personify the best as well as the worst traits of a free society. But let's try to understand, not the personalities, but the fundamental structural differences between unfree and free societies. Because in many ways, 
the war that is being fought in Ukraine today is an absolutely classic conflict between a free and an unfree society. The reason that I believe Ukrainians are fighting so tenaciously against the Russian invaders is precisely that they have come to understand since the breakup of the Soviet Union what a free society is. And in contrast to many of the inhabitants of longer established free societies, Ukrainians have shown themselves willing to fight and, if necessary, to die for freedom. Let's talk some more about freedom. Now, forgive me if there are too many words on these slides, but words matter. Don't worry, you don't have to read them all. I'll pick out the highlights. The first of my five witnesses is an extraordinary Russian, Yevgenia Zamyatin. He was born in 1884 in Lebedian. He was, in fact, an active Bolshevik. He was imprisoned and twice exiled for his participation in the 1905 revolution. But he became the first dissident in the Soviet Union after its uh, creation in the wake of the 1917 revolution, when he wrote a book, We, which I can't recommend to you enough. We was the first book banned by the Soviet censors. When it was published abroad, it led him into such political trouble that he eventually emigrated. And he died in obscurity in Paris in 1937. We is an extraordinary book. It inspired, amongst other, the more amongst other books, the more famous 1984 by George Orwell. It's set in a future one state whose ruler is known as the benefactor. The one state's a surveillance state, and it's a more ruthlessly efficient surveillance state than Orwell's in 1984. Every individual is a cipher. They all have numbers, not names. They wear standardized UNIFs, short for uniforms, and they're under round-the-clock surveillance to the extent that all apartments in the one state are made of glass and curtains can only be drawn when one's having sex, but sex has to be licensed by the state. The culmination of, of we uh, is a revolution, an insurrection against the surveillance state, in response to which the benefactor orders mass lobotomization of all ciphers. And in a remarkable encounter, the benefactor says as follows, what have people from the very cradle prayed for, dreamed about, and agonized over? They've wanted someone, anyone, to tell them once and for all what happiness is, and then to attach them to this happiness with a chain. If you haven't read Zemyatin's We, I urge you to do so. In many ways, it is a more prescient and more profound work than Orwell's masterpiece, 1984, and certainly a more prescient one than Aldous Huxley's earlier Brave New World. My next witness is a very different kind of person. Victor Klemperer was born in 1881, uh, the son of a rabbi. Uh, but he was uh, raised a secular a Jew, served in the Bavarian military during the Great War. And in 1906, he married a Protestant, did not consider himself uh, a Jew in religion. He was an academic professor of languages and literature, and he describes in his extraordinary diary what it is to have your rights sliced away. Few people, I think, understand uh, what it was to be a Jew in the Germany of the 1930s and 1940s because they don't appreciate how this process operated. We know Primo Levi well. We think we understand the Holocaust because we've read Primo Levi, but we 
don't really understand the process that led the German Jews from near total assimilation by the end of the 1920s to near annihilation by the 1940s. Klemperer's diary is the way into this problem because each salami slice of his civil and political rights is described in this extraordinary journal. He loses his job in 1935 uh, as a professor. Then he's barred from libraries. Then he loses certain of his privileges as a veteran. He loses his typewriter, his driving license. He's forced to move out of his home and live in a so-called Jew's house. He's banned from public parks. In June 1941, he's imprisoned for a week for a minor infraction of the blackout regulations. In September of the same year, he has to wear the yellow star. As one reads one's way through this remarkable document, one realizes that this was a process that was bureaucratic, uh, sadistic psychologically, but very different from a rush to annihilation. In February 1945, uh, near the end of the war, Klemperer was about to be transported to a concentration camp. Ironically, what saved him was the bombing of Dresden by the Royal Air Force, the destruction, near destruction of that city, which allowed him to discard his yellow star and conceal his identity for the remainder of the war. After the war, he stayed in Dresden, which became part of the Soviet zone of occupation, and later of the German Democratic Republic. As a philologist, Klemperer was extraordinarily astute in observing the way that language was used uh, in order to spread the ideas of uh, the Nazis imperceptibly. And I want to just take two passages from the diary to illustrate the importance of that insight. The first is from his prison journal uh, from late June to early July, 1941. How could I know beforehand what imprisonment, what a cell is? Only at the second that the door fell shut, that the latch fell into place, did I know it with a nameless fear. At that second, the eight days turned into 192 hours, empty, caged hours. And from then on, the awareness of the heavy hours did not leave me again and became the real torment of these days. There was no getting away from it. And each one passed more slowly than the one before, and each had its particular restraint. In this passage, Klemperer captures the shock of being in a cell. The shock that a professor feels when suddenly he is in captivity. It's a brilliant and memorable passage. It's one of many in this extraordinary diary that has stayed with me. Another is a very different account uh, from later in the same year, in which he characterizes the greatly changed mood in Germany after the uh, invasion of the Soviet Union. Hitler's proclamation to the army is a model example of LTI. LTI was Klemperer's code for lingua tertii imperii, the language of the Third Reich. Excessive piling up of the Barnum superlatives, underneath it uncertainty, fear. Fanatical twice. The form corresponds to the veiled in part mysterious content. For consideration, a few weeks ago the Russians were officially annihilated. Now they are to be annihilated in the spring. You merely need to hold out fanatically to what you've already conquered. Why difficulties just at this point when the world power Japan, not a great power, has annihilated the USA's Pacific fleet? Why has the winter in Russia broken so unexpectedly early? We, Eva, his wife and I, rack our brains. Have new Russian armies appeared? Or has Germany sent troops to another front? To which one? I put my money on American threat to Scandinavia from Iceland. But everything remains obscure. Certainty? He will fall. Uncertainty, one, when, two, before we do.
What Klemperer illustrates in his diary is that there were two forms of captivity in the Third Reich. There was the captivity of those who were imprisoned, sent to concentration camps, sent ultimately to death camps. But there was also the prison of propaganda. It was impossible to know the truth in Nazi Germany. One could only guess it by reading between the lines of the language of the Third Reich. And this is an extremely important point that I want to come back to that captures an essential truth about freedom. Freedom is partly freedom from captivity, but it's also freedom from ignorance, freedom from lies, freedom of information. My third uh, witness uh, was a remarkable uh, scholar, Czesław Milos, uh, a Polish author and poet, best known for his book, The Captive Mind. Milos was bo born in uh, Kovno, which is uh, uh, now part of Lithuania, but was then a part of the Russian Empire, and spent much of his early life in Vilno, now Vilnius, but then uh, a Polish city. Despite the fact that he worked to save Jews from the Nazis, uh, he and his future wife managed to survive the German occupation of Warsaw uh, during the war. And after 1945, Milos landed a job as the cultural attaché for the new Polish government. But when the communist authorities divined that he was not towing the party line, Milos fled. During the McCarthy era, he was viewed with suspicion and wasn't initially admitted to the US, but instead went to France where he wrote uh, and published The Captive Mind. Later, he became a professor at Berkeley, uh, where he had a memorable encounter with the student revolutionaries of 1968. But let me take you back to 1953 and this extraordinary text, The Captive Mind, and in particular, uh, the second ch chapter, Looking to the West. Don't worry, I'm not going to read all of this uh, pa uh, passage to you. Uh, life uh, and time are too short. Uh, but I want to simply sketch the argument that Milos makes. Uh, it so uh, grabbed my attention when I uh, recently read it that I photographed the pages uh, with an almost shaking hand. Milos argues that Americans have no idea what it is uh, to be in a society that has collapsed in time of war. His description of the collapse of Warsaw, and it's clearly intended to be Warsaw, into fear, uh, panic, and terror is one of the most memorable I've ever read of that experience. His description of the scene after order breaks down will always stay in my mind. His first stroll along a street littered with glass from bomb-shattered windows shakes his faith in the naturalness of his world. The wind scatters papers from hastily evacuated offices, papers labelled confidential or top secret, and so on. What Miosh does brilliantly is to convey an experience that happened to a great many Europeans, continental Europeans, that is, between 1939 and 1945. And it is, of course, the experience that Ukrainians uh, are going through now. The sudden and extraordinary destruction of order and the creation of conditions of terror in which the sole priority of the individual is survival, bare survival. In the concluding uh, part of this uh, passage, he makes an extremely astute observation. The man of the East, he writes, cannot take Americans seriously because they've never undergone the experiences that teach men how relative their judgments and thinking habits are. Their resultant lack of imagination is appalling. Because they were born and raised in a given social order and in a given system of values, they believe that any other order must be unnatural and it cannot last because it's incompatible with human nature that even they may one day know fire, hunger, and the sword. In all probability, this is what will occur. 
For it is hard to believe that when one half of the world is living through terrible disasters, the other half can continue a 19th century mode of life, learning about the distress of its distant fellow men only from movies and newspapers. Well, it hasn't happened yet, though I suppose there was a glimpse of it on September the uh, 11th, 2001. Today, it seems to me what Milos said about Americans in the 1950s applies especially to young Americans who seem especially unable to envision a situation in which order collapsed and survival is the sole imperative. I've got time before uh, we go to discussion to introduce just two more witnesses of unfreedom. Sharnush Parsapur uh, was a scholar uh, born in Tehran, in Iran, in 1946, a student of Chinese language and civilization who studied at the Sorbonne in the late 1970s. When the Islamic Revolution broke out in 1979, life uh, for scholars such as Parsapur changed dramatically. She was imprisoned four times uh, by the uh, Islamic uh, regime. Uh, Eventually, in 1994, she moved to the United States, and it was there that she wrote her prison memoir, which has been translated into English as Kissing the Sword. I recently read this book uh, because I wanted a better understanding into the experience of women uh, in the Islamic Republic. I won't read the entirety of the passage that uh, stood out for me, uh, which deals with uh, the shocking experience of mass execution within earshot of prisoners in a crowded prison in Tehran. Let me just quote one passage that has really stuck with me. The night of the heavy machine gun fire passed bitterly. We counted more than 250 single shots. These were the single shots administered after the machine gunning of a mass of prisoners to make sure that each individual was dead. Later, we learned that several prisoners from each unit had been taken to the prosecutor's office earlier that night and had been hastily tried, each trial lasting no more than a few minutes. Then they were divided into two lines along the corridor, one to be put to death, the other to return to prison. One prisoner had been forced to sit for hours at the table where they piled up the belongings of those sentenced to death. She sat there and stared at the toothbrushes, towels, and overcoats and counted the single shots. They returned her to the unit the following morning, her face a mask of terror. On the list was one of the two pretty girls I'd seen leave the unit the day before. The newspaper claimed she'd been executed because she'd committed adultery. I never tried to find out whether it was the aunt or the niece who was killed. I knew that in Islam they stoned adulteresses, but four unbiased witnesses had to have seen the act of adultery. I wondered in what situation they could have found this girl that would explain putting her in front of a firing squad. It's often struck me that those uh, who read The Handmaid's Tale uh, and imagine that what's depicted there is some nightmare uh, future of a conservative America misunderstand that it's actually a dismal uh, representation of a life. Uh, in the Islamic Republic. Uh, Margaret Atwood has never explicitly acknowledged this, but in some interviews, she certainly hinted that that was a part of the inspiration uh, for the book. My last witness is Yu Hua, a Chinese author, uh, younger than the other authors in my uh, talk, born as recently as 1960 in Hangzhou, to two doctor parents. Yu Hua grew up in a somewhat obscure uh, part of China, Wuhan Township in Haiyang and Shandong. He was uh, rejected by the universities and ended up training as a dentist before he turned uh, to writing. Uh, the passage I've chosen is from his book, China in 10 Words. And it goes up to the heart of the phenomenon of the leadership cult. It describes the moments uh, in his high school uh, when Mao Zedong's death is announced. 
Our leader was dead. My eyes, too, filled with tears, and I wept like the thousand others. I heard heart-rending screeches and earth-shaking howls. People gasped for breath and choked in anguish. And then my mind began to wander. Grief no longer held me in its sway. My thoughts started moving in another direction entirely. If it had been just a few people weeping, I would certainly have felt sad, but a thousand people all weeping at the same time simply struck me as funny. I'd never in my life heard such a cacophony. Even if every living variety of beast were to send a delegate to our auditorium and they were all to bellow in unison, I thought to myself, they surely couldn't make a stranger chorus than the din of a thousand people crying their heads off. This untimely fancy might have been the death of me. I couldn't help but smile. And then I had to fight back the laugh that was pushing its way out. If anybody were to see me laughing, I'd be labelled a counter-revolutionary on the spot and life wouldn't be worth living. Hard as I tried to bottle up my laughter, it insisted on spilling forth. And knowing I couldn't stifle it any longer, I desperately threw myself forward, hugging the back of the chair in front of me and buried my head in my folded arms. Amid the weeping of a thousand people, I was in the throes of uncontainable mirth, my shoulders heaving, and the more I tried to stop myself from laughing, the more the laughs kept coming. My classmates, through a curtain of tears, saw me sprawled over a chair, racked by agonizing spasms of grief. They were deeply moved by my devotion to our fallen leader, and later they would say, Yu Hua was more upset than anyone. You should have seen the way he was crying. Let me sum up. The 20th first century has a lot to learn from the 20th. And the more recently you were born, the more I think you have to learn. I am old enough to have visited the Soviet Union. I'm old enough to have spent time in the German Democratic Republic. I spent a good deal of time in the People's Republic of China. I grew up in Scotland, in the United Kingdom. I lived and worked in West Germany before moving to the United States. I've sampled, in other words, both free and unfree societies in my life. But it seems to me that that's got harder to do, certainly since 1989 to 91. And relatively few people, in my experience, go to North Korea, or for that matter, go to Cuba and appreciate what it is about Cuba that is sinister rather than picturesque. What I've tried to do with these five glimpses, five witnesses uh, of unfreedom, is to identify and make vivid five of the essential features uh, of a free society and their opposites. The essentials are privacy and autonomy, equality before the law, basic security, freedom from fear, and accountable leaders. And the reason we know they're essentials is that as we read these five witnesses, we see what their opposites meant. To be under constant surveillance like the characters in Zemyatin's We, is itself an intolerable violation of freedom. And one of the terrible ironies of 21st century life is that we have evolved a parallel system of surveillance in the capitalist world that seems in many ways as good as, if not superior to, the system of surveillance that they've developed in the People's Republic of China. Discrimination. The discrimination that selects certain social groups and treats them differently from others is always bad, even when it's motivated by the notion of social justice, even when it's called affirmative action, even when it's said that some reparations are being conducted uh, for past wrongs. The fact of discrimination is always inequality before the law, and it never leads anywhere good, no matter what revolutionary ideology may motivate it. Disorder, 
chaos. Organized lethal violence is the thing that nearly always precedes the destruction of freedom. That is illustrated well in Mariupol, Kharkiv, and multiple other uh, towns and cities in Ukraine. It's illustrated most hideously and memorably in the little town of Bucha on the outskirts of Kyiv, a city I know well, where atrocities unlike anything we've seen uh, since World War II, certainly seen in Europe since World War II, were carried out within a matter of uh, the last six weeks uh, by Russian soldiers. What I think uh, Milos is telling us is that if we lose the most fundamental security, then we are within a hair's breadth of losing freedom too. His argument in that passage from which I quoted a part is that when violence suddenly dominates the landscape, when all sense of personal security is gone, then it's extremely difficult to uphold a free society because mere survival becomes the sole imperative. Fear is crucial to unfreedom. It seems to me that in the prison memoir that I quoted from a moment ago, you have a very clear sense, a vivid, unforgettable sense of what fear is. To be inside a prison listening to a mass execution with no sense of whether or not you will be next tomorrow seems to me the essence of fear. And fear is something profoundly harmful and traumatic to the individual. It's essential to any unfree society, any authoritarian regime, that it should be able to engender fear. I believe, in fact, that you cannot have an unfree society without terror, without threats of violence. Finally, notice the importance of the personality cult in Yuhua's recollections of the Cultural Revolution. Personality cults are an integral part of unfree societies. The exaltation of one individual above all others, the deification of Mao in the People's Republic of China, of Stalin in the Soviet Union, of Hitler in the Third Reich, this is a pathology we should always be extremely wary of. I like my politicians not to be stars. One of the things that I liked about Volodymyr Zelensky when I met him was that despite his success as a television entertainer, he was extraordinarily self-deprecating, a down-to-earth, indeed self-mocking in his personality. We should be on the lookout for leaders that don't take themselves too seriously. And we should always be extremely wary of humorless leaders who crave the kind of personality cult that is obviously Vladimir Putin's uh, design uh, for Russia. I now hope to have concluded uh, my talk, and I hope that in this talk I've made it clear why it's so important to think of freedom and unfreedom as two sides of a coin of human experience. And above all, why it is that I want to teach a course on this subject uh, at the University of Austin Summer School in June. I can think of no more important role that a historian can play in the year 2022 than to educate the next generation about the nature of unfreedom. Surely only by understanding its opposite can we teach young people in the United States in Brazil and around the world, the absolute sanctity of liberty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Wonderful first-hand lecture on your, your next course at University of Austin. Um, I'm going to start picking up from your uh, last two lists. Um, we can see both some principles, but also um, informal and formal institutions sh such as equality before the law. Um, at the end of the day, uh, institutions are made by people, and people built absolutism, but they also built the glorious revolution, and they built the American Revolution, and established the rule of law that allowed for freedom later. Um, with all your knowledge from past historic moments, 
what, what, what do you think are the secrets for these people that built freedom? Uh, how do they do it? What are, I don't know, special characteristics, characteristics they may have? Uh, what can history teach us how to build these institutions? You're absolutely right, uh, Gabriel, that institutions are the key. That's uh, an old and well-known finding uh, of scholars uh, going back to Douglas North, and I would say going back to Adam Smith. But I think we need to remember that, that institutions don't have magical power, uh, that constitutions are merely documents. Uh, and in some contexts, they're documents that lack staying power. Uh, some work that I did a few years ago with the Venezuelan scholar Daniel Landsberg Rodriguez focused on how many constitutions Latin America has seen since the time of Bolivar. And uh, the most obvious takeaway is that the more often a country changes its constitution, uh, the less free it ends up being. I think Venezuela leads the field in terms of the number of constitutions it's had since independence. So when we talk about institutions, we must remember that they are only as good as the spirit, and I use the term uh, quite deliberately, that animates them. And Montesquieu, of course, wrote of the spirit of the laws. And I think uh, we spend too much time talking about laws and not enough time talking about their spirit. Uh, the English common law is not a set uh, text. On the contrary, it's an evolving uh, body uh, of judgments uh, animated by a distinctive spirit that can trace its uh, origins back many centuries. One of the reasons that I'm uh, inclined to think of myself uh, more as a conservative than as a classical liberal is that I think classical liberals underestimate the importance of tradition uh, in animating uh, the spirit of uh, a society with the rule of law. So in the work I've done in, in this field in the last decade, uh, for example, in the book Civilization, I tried to argue that the, the rise of free societies in the English-speaking world, uh, owed a lot to that spirit as much as to any institutional design. Uh, in many ways, it was contingency more than design that produced uh, a free society in England, a contingency that had to do with the weakness of the crown, the relative autonomy of the courts, as well as corporate bodies, a series of accidents uh, in royal politics, uh, one of which was the glorious revolution that you mentioned. Americans are fascinated by a revolutionary event, the founding of the Republic, and the, the Constitution that arose from that revolution. And that leads them, I think, to a slightly naive view that if you only get the institution right and then interpret it with sufficient fidelity to the founders and Pensions, you'll be okay. The terrible truth is that it's very hard to maintain uh, the healthy spirit of a revolutionary republic. Uh, and this is something that I, I am greatly concerned about because I see signs of uh, what might be called republican decadence uh, in the United States today. I worry more about the United States than about the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom is rooted in a set of traditions uh, which are very hard, I think, to dislodge. Uh, whereas the United States pins much too much uh, of its hope on a document and the formal institutions uh, that were set up by the Constitution. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going on the same direction here of, the, uh, of what we're talking right now. Um, one of the things I remember from reading The Square and the Tower 
uh, when you mentioned about the, the strength of building networks and that networks made people networks, they, they allowed many of those historical moments that changed the course in Western hemisphere uh, and led us to build many free societies here is that in America, and not only in America, but uh, in Western Europe, there were at the time many networks of people connected, uh, civil, uh, 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 a very important and strong civil society with different yes. clubs and different groups advocating for change, advocating and, and financing uh, either journalists, people that were spreading the word of liberty, etc. Do you think we are seeing an escalation of autocracies and assaults on freedom because our civil society groups have become more silent, more lenient with autocracies? I think that's a great question, Gabriel, because in the square in the tar, I made the argument that the totalitarian regimes of the mid 20th century systematically stamped out associational life of all kinds. Uh, there was simply no place for any autonomous organization, any kind of social network in Stalin's Soviet Union. In fact, Stalin policed even friendships, the most informal kind of association that we know. In the Third Reich, uh, it was the same story. Uh, Hans Verlader's wonderful uh, book, Alone in Berlin, uh, captures the impossibility of autonomous uh, networked opposition in the Third Reich. The tragic attempt, uh, which he describes of an ordinary couple whose son has been killed early in the war to uh, disseminate uh, anti-war messages in Berlin by leaving cards in random places where they'll be found by ordinary people. This fails completely uh, because its premise is that people will spontaneously share information uh, as opposed to handing the cards immediately to the Gestapo. So it's very important for us to understand that, uh, that a free society is not something mandated by a constitution. A free society exists independently of politics uh, in the form of associational life. Uh, Forum uh, uh, da Liberdade is part of this uh, phenomenon in uh, Brazil today. I belong, I'm glad to say, to multiple voluntary associations uh, that are engaged in a variety of activities whose common thread is to promote freedom. And it seems to me that as long as we are all engaged in that kind of activity, we have a shot at preserving a free society. But as Charles Murray and others pointed out now more than a decade ago, in the United States, the voluntary associational life that Tocqueville was so impressed by when he visited uh, North America in the early 19th century has to a terrifying extent atrophied. Uh, in some cases, in recent times, it's been replaced uh, by government activity. In other cases, there are much uh, less satisfying surrogates in the form of online social networks uh, that are a pale shadow of the real social networks of the past. I think the more we see association life eroded, uh, the worse uh, the prospects are for a free society. The key point is, that authoritarian regimes abhor autonomous social networks of any kind, even the unpolitical ones. And that's a clue that tells us they really matter. Uh, even if your club is only concerned with pigeons, uh, or even if its sole function is fishing, it still matters. It will still promote freedom because it will signal the readiness of citizens to work together. Uh, for common purposes, without any reference at all to the political sphere. Great, and um, I'll I'll dwell in a in a different direction here, uh, but I I think 
the at the end of the day the the questions are somewhat related um you you mentioned that the power of propaganda makes a very 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 important plays a very important role in autocracies and uh when we, when it comes to what's happening on ukraine um my question here is why propaganda from autocracies like russia are still efficient not only in russia but especially in the free world because for so much much time in western europe in brazil i i, I guess in america was also the same we've been seeing some kind of indulgency not only with russia but also but also with china um have we not learned lesson of how these guys play their 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 game one of the things that changed with the advent of the internet uh, that most commentators underestimated was uh, the emergence of uh, a public sphere without borders. If you think back uh, to when I was a kid, I was a teenager in the 1970s, to an extraordinary extent, uh, public spheres were national. Uh, we might see some television uh, series that we imported from the United States, uh, but the news uh, and most of the content that we watched was uh, British in origin. And when one traveled to North America, as I did to visit my Canadian cousins, one entered a very different public sphere, uh, which was fascinating. Uh, precisely because it was so unfamiliar. Gradually, uh, in the last 20 years, the rise of network platforms uh, such as Facebook with explicitly global aspirations has created a public sphere that has no borders. And uh, authoritarian regimes turned out to be pretty good at exploiting uh, that suddenly uh, easier access uh, to American and also uh, to European and even also Latin American uh, publics. As is well known, and I wrote about this in the Square and the Tower, the Russians uh, did a good deal to try to sow misinformation and disinformation and dissension in the United States uh, in 2016. I don't think it was decisive in the election of that year because Americans were very good at generating their own political content. Uh, but it was certainly uh, successful in spreading uh, messages that appeared to be American in origin, but in fact were Russian. Uh, more recently, the Chinese have tried to do this. They're much less good at it than the Russians. In fact, Chinese uh, content doesn't even do well in Taiwan, where you would have thought uh, they would have been reasonably successful. The other thing to notice is that the Chinese very carefully from the earliest stages made sure that their public sphere was not open. The Great Firewall of China, uh, designed to prevent the internet being truly global by creating a separate Chinese internet, has been hugely important to the success of Xi Jinping as a totalitarian leader. I don't think it would have been possible to do all that he's done since he came to power if it had been relatively easy for ordinary Chinese citizens to access uh, Western platforms and Western content. But this is, I think, really a big difference between uh, the time uh, of my children and the time uh, of my generation. And, and it's one of those many differences that we, we slightly underestimate uh, because it's somewhat imperceptible, this change. I'm not sure there was ever a moment that anybody noticed that we globalized uh, culture. Uh, I'm not sure there was a moment uh, that we noticed that we'd created a public sphere that extended all the way from California around the world, uh, from California through the whole of Latin America, from California all the way to the borders of the people, People's Republic of China. But that is a huge change. And I go so far as to say it's one of the biggest historical changes of my lifetime. Great. Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, 
social control on when your when your uh, your accounts and your examples before because um, it brings me to my to my next question and um, I'll guess I'll be very re repeated repetitive here if I'd say that sometimes when I look at that social credit system the Chinese are building um, it looks like 1984 and I'm not the first one who's, who's, who's saying this many many people have said that and um, do you think this is this might play a role in the West also because um, for example many countries used uh, available data for people to build networks to track and isolate the people uh, contaminated by COVID. And this, this was very important during the pandemic for, to, to fight COVID in, in, in some places. But it can also be used for, for evil purposes. It can also be used to control and to, and to try to find what people are doing, who are they assembling together with, et cetera. What, what's your remarks on this? In my most recent book, uh, Doom, I was uh, very positive in my assessment of uh, the Taiwanese and South Korean responses uh, to the outbreak of uh, the COVID pandemic in 2020. And their responses included uh, contact tracing, uh, particularly the South Korean response, uh, along with uh, very early large-scale testing and effective quarantining of infected or potentially infected people. And when you consider uh, how many people died in our countries, in the United States uh, and in Brazil, uh, compared with uh, South Korea and Taiwan, uh, it seems like they did something right. Was there a risk uh, to using technology uh, in that way? Yes. And I think the South Koreans uh, came to realize uh, that they had, in fact, uh, overstepped uh, the mark in using, for example, credit card data as part of their early contact tracing. When I was in Taiwan and I subsequently had a conversation with their digital minister, Audrey Tang, on this subject, I learned how much the Taiwanese government thinks about this, precisely because they see the difference between a free and an unfree society by just looking across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, the last thing they want to do in Taiwan is to create their own version of the social credit system that exists on the mainland. And I was impressed by the thought that they had put into making sure that data gathered for one function, such as contact tracing in a pandemic, could not be made available for any other function. Uh, you have to have vaults, uh, you have to have meaningful walls to ensure that uh, the data of that sort are not misused, not abused uh, for any uh, purpose other than that for which they're gathered. Uh, a similar problem arises in the United Kingdom, which has some of the best health data uh, in the world, precisely because there is a relatively centralized national health service. Uh, now, that data, that so source of data is very welcome to researchers, uh, but it creates a potential risk for ordinary British citizens that the state knows far too much uh, about their individual uh, health and therefore behavior? The answer, it seems to me, cannot be to renounce the use of technology for purposes such as preventing the spread of a dangerous disease. What we have to do is make sure that we design these technologies in ways that do not undermine liberty. And that should be as important a priority in our minds as saving lives. Uh, that's doable. The technological problems are not that hard. Uh, but we need knowingly to prioritize individual liberty and privacy. You'll remember that I began my talk by emphasizing privacy. And the reason that I referenced Zamyatin's we is that it's actually very close to the kind of society that China is becoming. What is fascinating, uh, Gabriel, is that we see at the moment in Shanghai uh, 
the first signs of the kind of revolt against the surveillance state that Zamyatin describes in his book. Uh, I don't know if you've watched the videos of ordinary people in Shanghai literally screaming from the tower blocks where they've been in prison effectively. It's very eerie, uh, but it reminds us that even in Xi Jinping's China, the individual human desire for freedom cannot be quenched. Whether you are Chinese or Brazilian, Russian or British, American or Ukrainian, even North Korean or Cuban, we as individual human beings have a very powerful desire for privacy, desire for autonomy. We have an instinct for equality before the law, a sense of the most basic justice. That's all there inbuilt in our evolved psychology. And that is something that inclines me towards optimism. The more they protest against the surveillance state in China, the happier I am. I have seen the, the footage. It's, it's indeed, it's very shocking. But um, I had the same feeling you had, uh, that at the end of the day, no matter how, how much you try to control, how much you can brainwash a society or someone, eventually the feelings are there and you, and you fight for freedom. You, it, it, it's like an instinct, the same as you would protect your son in, front, in face of danger or something like the, of the sort. It's very, I, I urge everyone who's, who's watching us to take a look at the footage on the internet. It's shocking, but also it brings this to light. Um, I would like to go to, on a different direction here, Neil. Uh, I would love to explore many of your uh, knowledge on geopolitics. And I have a question from the audi audience. Someone saying that um, in one of the panels before we, we started ours, uh, one of the speakers, Sergio Moro, who was uh, the car wash judge, uh, the car wash operation judge, He told us that he went this year to America and Germany and people there were talking about we are heading into a world where we'll divide uh, the uh, countries in democratic regimes and autocratic regimes and that the people he listened to, the ones who talked to him, told him that they think Brazil is more likely to be in the autocratic regime side. Um, From all your knowledge in geopolitics, do you, do you see this is more likely or do you see our tradition in being very um, more neutral might play a good role in this? What, what, what's your view from the outside? Well, I've had the privilege of meeting uh, Sergio Moro and respect very much uh, the work that, that he did uh, in fighting for the rule of law uh, in Brazil. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating that on his uh, travels, uh, he heard this view expressed. I have argued for the last four years that we are in Cold War II. Uh, it's different from Cold War I in some respects, namely uh, that in Cold War II, the senior partner on the other side is China and Russia is the junior partner. Uh, But in other respects, I think these two uh, conflicts have much in common. In both Cold War I and Cold War II, uh, there's a non-aligned movement. Uh, that's clear. There are countries that do not want to take sides. Uh, and uh, I think, again, it will be a different set of countries uh, in this uh, second Cold War uh, who will seek to be non-aligned. Often, these will be countries with very large economic relationships uh, to China and, and not particularly strong e uh, military reliance on the United States. Uh, and Brazil would seem to fit into that uh, category. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think that means uh, that we should think of, uh, of Brazil as undemocratic or Brazilians as uh, uh, hostile to liberty. My impression is that uh, Brazil has, in fact, a, a strong libertarian uh, streak and no particular affinity uh, with authoritarian 
government. Brazil's problems uh, are ones that you may have recognized as I was telling my story earlier. Uh, when I was last in Porto Alegre, uh, which was before uh, the election of President Bolsonaro, I was assured by a number of people that the central problem of life was crime uh, and the lack of, uh, of safety in the streets. And this makes me think of, of Milosh's captive mind. Once you are faced with basic lack of safety in your daily life, uh, everything else becomes a luxury and you start uh, to look for candidates who offer you uh, some kind of increase in your security. And I, I think that's a very fundamental problem uh, for Brazil, uh, just as it's a problem for many other Latin American uh, countries. Uh, we, we forget this too easily uh, if we sit in the comfort, as I often do, of Northern California. But you don't have to travel too far from the Stanford campus to downtown San Francisco to see the beginnings of the same process of decay in the streets there. And one of the arguments that I, I've been trying to make uh, and will make in this new course at the University of Austin is that the great danger for a free society is that it forgets the basic uh, foundations of liberty and unwittingly throws them away. Uh, that is the process that I think one can see happening, uh, not only in parts of South America, but also in parts of North America today. I'm noticing, incidentally, that, that, that according at least to my clock, We've run out of time, but uh, you may want to uh, you may want to extend to ask me a final question, Gabriel. I leave that to you. Thank you for your kindness, Neil. Um, I would like to go to this final question. You're right. Unfortunately, our time is up, and unfortunately, I've, I believe I speak on behalf of all our audience when I say this. Um, we've been seeing in not only in America. This is happening here too. Uh, this rise of um, language uh, change and identity politics, this has invaded camp Campy, it invaded, uh, created this woke culture, and uh, it's running the show sometimes when it comes to culture wars. Um, number one, where do you think that came from? And number two, could you tell us more about your initiative on the University of Austin? Because... I believe this is uh, very well connected with, with what's happening on campuses. Well, one of the things I never expected early in my career, uh, back in my Oxford days, was that, that it would be on university campuses that the biggest threats uh, to free thought, uh, uh, free speech, and free association uh, would arise. Uh, that seemed extraordinarily unlikely uh, from the vantage point of 1980s Oxford and Cambridge, where academics seemed to be free uh, to say uh, the most outrageous things with impunity, and in fact were positively encouraged to be outrageous. All that changed uh, beginning in the United States over, a, I would say, the last 20 years, but with the last five years seeing the most rapid change. And explaining why this happened is extremely hard, uh, though many people, like my good friend Jonathan Haidt, uh, believe they have the answer. I think it's partly uh, generational. Uh, it's partly to do with uh, the rise of social media. But the main driver is, in reality, a steady leftward drift of, of universities uh, amongst uh, tenured faculty, but also amongst administrators and, uh, and university presidents. Uh, and as people move left, they move away from uh, liberalism. Uh, they enter the realm of progressivism and then socialism. Uh, and, and ultimately, a lot of what we have to deal with today can indeed be described as cultural Marxism. Having lost the economic debates in the 1980s, uh, the Marxists rather ingeniously reinvented themselves uh, as uh, culture warriors and uh, social justice uh, warriors and took identity politics instead of class warfare as their mode of operation. This has been hugely successful and conservatives have largely uh, seeded the field. Uh, the last conservative uh, at Harvard will presumably turn out the lights one day 
way in the relatively near future, uh, because there certainly won't be many for very long, because it's impossible uh, for anybody right of centre to get hired uh, at a major university these days, certainly in the humanities and social sciences. The reason for creating the University of Austin is simply that we need a, an institution in academic life that is not under this kind of woke management, not least so that scholars whose careers are being destroyed have somewhere to go to. People like Peter Bogosian or Al Kathleen Stock, to name just two. Uh, so this is a beginning, it's a startup, uh, but I believe that if we model academic freedom, we show uh, that free thought, uh, free speech, free debate, free inquiry, these things are superior uh, to the kind of woke surveillance campus uh, that exists elsewhere, then students will flock to us and then we will soon have imitators. Uh, the illustration, I think, is of the point we made earlier that it's only by individual uh, and non-state networks uh, that we can create the kind of institutions that we need in a free society. We shouldn't expect freedom to be conferred on us, whether it's by the government or by Harvard University. Uh, if we want there to be freedom in academic life, we have to build it. Uh, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do with my colleagues at the University of Austin. Neil, thank you so much for your time, for being with us online. We hope we can have you here in Porto Alegre as soon as possible. And thank you so much for your lecture and for building the University of Austin. Thank you very much indeed. It's great to be with you. And I look forward to being there in person next time. Bye-bye. Goodbye.